Greetings from Jimmy's Old Time Radio Show. It's a real privilege to be talking with Brian Hewson here at Escarpment Sounds, kind of in between Fergus and Guelph. It's a studio where I've done two records now. We're today talking about a third. But we're also talking about a Canadian music legend, somebody that Brian knows well, or rather knew well. And um, I say in the present tense because he's still with us in so many ways, talking about stomping Tom Connors. His music lives on, and I perform his music regularly in my senior living audiences. And Brian, you've had a long connection with Stomp and Tom Connors. How did you meet Stomp and Tom, and when did you meet him? I met him, I think it was around 1987. I had a smaller studio in Acton, Ontario, and uh, it was my first studio. This is the third one now. And I had this small studio I just started, and the local paper had done an article on me because I was a new business in town. And Tom had just come out of retirement. He hadn't performed for 10 years. This, for anybody that knows his backstory, this is when he was really mad at the people from the Junos. Yes. And he, would, he had taken all those Junos back in a box and put it on their doorstep. Yeah. He was boycotting everything, and he thought, I'm not going to play. I've had it. Mm -hmm. And then he realized he wasn't getting the word out. Mm -hmm. Nobody, if you're silent, nobody knows what you're yeah. boycotting against. Yeah. So he decided it's time to get back out. Let's get playing. So he took 10 years off, I believe. And then he decided to come back with a new record. And so he, uh, he was looking for a studio to record in. And uh, the studio he would use before that, which was in Norville called Orchard, was busy at the time and said they couldn't get him in. And so he was looking for somewhere else and uh, saw an article on my little place because it was a very small studio. It was maybe 14 feet long by 10 feet wide. Mm. It was very small, mm. just with a sliding door in between. Yeah. And uh, he saw the article and came out and he looked around the little place and he said, it's big enough for me, let's do it. He liked to keep things simple, didn't he? Yes. Came in, record straight off the floor, Yeah. came in prepared. What you said about protesting the Junos is one of the uh, real interesting things about Stomp and Tom. He stood up for the for the for the people of Canada. He was a true patriot, and he stood up for the musicians. And um, his protest with the Junos, to my understanding, was because of the the influx of the uh, the American influence into the whole Juno Awards system. So he was standing up for Canadian musicians because he himself, I know felt like he was often pushed aside and didn't get as much radio play as he felt he deserved. But boy, oh boy, he really left an impression on on the Canadian music scene. I specialize in concerts for senior living, and when I play retirement home concerts and I play Stomp and Tom, say Sudbury Saturday Night up in Sudbury, or Tilsonburg down in Tilsonburg, or uh, uh, Bud the Spud out in PEI, these songs are incredible, the reactions that I get. Now, none of the songs I just mentioned were ones that you recorded, right? No, that was all before my time. Yes, but how many records did you do with him? I think it's around 13 now. We still have some coming out of yes. unreleased material. Posthumous material. They're coming called out, yeah. Songs from the Vault, and we just did another one last year. So I think there's either one or two more to come out. We did 120 songs wow. just before he died that were unreleased. And so I did, yeah, 13 CDs with them. So these 120 songs, they were previously recorded, or did you record them when he was at that later stage in his life? I recorded them just before he died. Wow. So those are extremely precious. It's just him and the guitar. Yeah. Wow. Tom was in some ways underestimated. Um, you know, his music is deceptively simple sounding, and some people slough him off as kind of a, as a yokel type of guy, but he was far more sophisticated than than met the eye like up there on stage pounding his foot and singing you know country songs but he was a sophisticated philosophical spiritual man a brilliant author um, two books so far and I say so far because apparently there's a third that uh, is in the works um, I've read these books um, so insightful the, very humorous. I guess he had quite a sense of humor, didn't he? He did. <laughs> <laughs> Any funny stories you'd like to share? 
I can't remember any offhand, but he was always playing jokes on people. Like I, ne I was never on the road with him, but I always heard stories from the musicians about him playing jokes and goofing around. And, uh, Won't be tied if you're on the road with him. I think. Yeah, keeping people up late at night. <laughs> yeah, he was a he was a hardcore guy. He smoked and drank. Smoked and, and drank like crazy. Yeah, played guitar and stayed up late, and he left it all on the stage. What was it like to work with Stop and Tom Connors? It was intense, actually, which, really? which is very strange. People think it would have been the opposite. Hmm. But uh, when he, whenever he booked for a CD, he just want to focus on it. So it would take maybe two weeks to do a CD, and he wouldn't want to take any time off. So it's 14 days straight. Every day would go to like 5 in the morning Wow! because he was a total night hawk. Yeah. We like to start maybe two in the afternoon, mm. and then his best singing voice came around one in the morning. A certain amount of lubrication yeah. involved, and a few drinks. And uh, every night we'd finish recording, and he'd always want to sit and have some beers with me, and talk until six in the morning. Mm. And I just had a young baby girl. <laughs> I had to get up in the morning with her. It was a little tough. But he was a client you couldn't turn down. I couldn't turn him down. No. He's the only one I let smoke cigarettes in the studio. <laughs> Otherwise, he wasn't going to come. But it was always intense, and he always he seemed to know what he wanted. Like he would uh, put tons of instruments on every song, like mm. fiddle and banjo and yes. everything. And then when it came time to mix, then we'd start taking things away that weren't going to work. So he would like to try everything. Listening to his material, I, I often hear instruments that are unusual as well. He used to bring in some strange color sounds, mm -hmm. just as often in the solo, um, just to add, like there's one song where there's this UFO kind of a sound. I forget yeah, that would be the steel guitar. Yeah, sound yeah. Like it's amazing UFO. how he was so innovative. Yeah. So once Tom was in the studio with you here, he found that he liked your room, he liked your style. He obviously liked working with you. We got along very well and that's, he stuck with me for I guess 28 years or something we worked wow. together and he just kept coming back yeah and uh, so this became more than a professional relationship you became we became friends I was friends. at his house very often and yeah. every time he had a party my wife and I were there and me and my wife and my daughter sometimes would always go to his place when things were going on wow so we were together quite a bit because he was a very private man he didn't have that many friends really which some people find hard to believe so he liked hanging around with us. We'd be at restaurants sometimes. And he let you into his inner world. Into, into the inner yeah. world, yeah. Now, didn't one of you go to the other one's wedding? He was at our wedding, yeah. Was he your best man or just at your wedding? Just at the wedding. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, him and his wife came. That was great. What an honor. Because we had, we had the wedding actually in my old studio. It was a stone barn. Okay. And the reception was there. And I didn't tell my friends that he was coming. And all of a sudden, he pulls up in his truck. And everybody's going, oh, great. With his... <laughs> Unmistakable black. He had the hat, hat on. on. Yeah. yeah, he wouldn't take it off. He even wouldn't take it off for the Queen of England. She no. allowed it. It was a religious symbol. He got to wear it for the Queen of England. That's right. Yeah. Now Tom had a really difficult childhood. Born in St. John, basically uh, on the streets with his young mother, uh, practically an orphan. And well, yeah, he did become an orphan. He was an orphan. They took, yeah. took him away from his mom when he was yeah. like five or six or yeah. something. And, just the most difficult childhood possible. Now he talk, Did he talk about that? A bit. He would get into the, how horrible it was at the uh, the orphanages and then foster homes. And he finally got to be with a family out in PEI, in Skinner's Pond, yeah. when he was, I guess, around grade 8 or something. Mm -hmm. and, but he kept saying that, you know, back then when people adopted a young boy, they mostly wanted them to do work. Yeah. That's why they got him. Was it there for the affection? Yeah. Was so there for the work? He said that his stepmom was a real cold woman. Yeah. And uh, he liked the fellow, I forget his name, that he lived with. But he just said it, was, it wasn't the greatest times and mm. he just wanted to get out of there. He describes yeah. in his book trying to create some relationship with her and just even to her dying day, he yeah. never really had He never did and he was so sad because he couldn't figure out why she wouldn't warm up to him. Yeah. Closest thing to a family he ever had. Yeah, it was. He was a lonely man, and he 
kept running away when he was a teenager, but it was on an island. Yeah. So the, yeah. the cops kept finding him when he tried to get the boat off. And there was no uh, big bridge connecting PEI no. at the time. You had to get hop the ferry and away yeah. you go, which he did ultimately do. And once he hit the highways, I think he was 12, 13 years old, yeah. he never looked back. He crisscrossed Canada hitchhiking. And that became fodder for all of these incredible songs, songs that really tell the story yep. of everyday Canadian folk. Yeah, he told me times that he would, he'd be there hitchhiking in the rain and people wouldn't be picking him up for days sometimes. Yeah. He would, he'd be on the side of the road and have to sleep in the barn that he saw. Half get starved. Back, yeah. get, you know, he'd go out and steal pies from ladies' windows. Yeah, I read that. Then he'd get back on the road and try to hitchhike. I mean... A lot of times people wouldn't pick you up, especially the more he's out there, the dirtier he's probably yes. looking. I'm sure he didn't smell wonderful. He was a, he was, he was a hobo. Like, yeah, he really was. From town to town, and trying to play for his uh, meal, you know. Now, the two books that are out, they've been out for a while, but it, you said to me earlier before we started filming that there is a third book. I believe there is. The fellow who was writing it died just as he was handing... The week he handed it in, and I forget the publisher's name, so I believe somebody has all the material on it. Could Looking be something forward else. to that. There'll be some more treasures in there. So it's like the third, sort of after the Connor's tone, so mm -hmm. into his professional career. And yes. What happened in those years. He does mention in his books that he was working on a third one, so I wonder how much of this is extrapolated directly from those notes. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a fascinating read. So you've been working on these uh, posthumous releases. And you are in touch with his family still, right? Yes. Tell the world about these releases that you're you're working on. Well, they're all just Tom and the guitar, and they're, none of them are originals. They're all old songs that he grew up with. Mm -hmm. So from the 40s, 30s, yeah, all that old country stuff that and he grew up with influenced him and the songs he loved. So we. Uh, between the family and the record company and myself, we put together what they want to put out. Uh, the last one we just did is just him and the guitar, but the previous one, a couple of years ago, we actually brought in outside musicians to play along with the tracks. Mm -hmm. So we had the Sheepdogs in and some mm -hmm. bands like that. Fantastic. To, to play, uh, you know, they just added parts to Tom singing and Tom was singing and playing guitar and nice. then they had their parts. And so they had a bunch of collaborators that way. And it's uh, it's great to see them putting out stuff. I mean, it's tough. I don't know where the product is because mm -hmm. they didn't even re the last one wasn't even on CD at all. It was only vinyl. Okay, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. Real purist. Yeah. Have you ever been to Skinner's Pond? Yep. Yes. On my honeymoon, I went out there and uh, we saw the old schoolhouse. Okay. They hadn't built that new center yet. Yes. Um, Skinner's Pond's a desolate place. I think it's why you wanted out of there. <laughs> I've been there. I drove by. In fact, I think I took a selfie and sent it to you that yeah, you morning. Did. It wasn't open the day I was there, but I, I had a concert in nearby uh, mm -hmm. uh, O'Leary, PEI. And uh, beautiful part of the province, so uh, all of PEI is incredible. Yeah. So Tom bought that property around where he used to live. Yeah. And that's where the center is now. And I believe him and his wife had donated that property for the, that purpose. I believe. Her name is Lena. Lena, yeah. yes. One thing I find interesting about Stomp and Tom's records is like when I'm traveling, touring all over Canada, I always go to thrift shops and I buy vinyl records of all the classics. I have yet to see a single Stomp and Tom record in a thrift shop. Why do you think that would be? I think people aren't giving them up. Mm. Because he's, uh, he's got a lot of records out there. He does. You know, uh, he had, when he did Bud the Spud and uh, those kind of things, they all went gold. Yeah. So people were holding on to them. There was a lot. And even the 13 or so that we did together, none of them went gold, but they're all around 30,000, 40,000 mm -hmm. were sold of each one. So there's a lot, yeah. a lot of them out there. But I think, like, he's he has a unique fan base because he's the only person I know that. Radio wouldn't play. Mm -hmm. you know, he showed me some of his checks from SoCan, yeah. and they were minimal checks way yeah. back in the, the day where the big stars were making millions. But he would go and do a concert and sold out. And his fan base 
would just buy everything off the merch table. Yes. They yes. just loved it. He describes that in his book too, how we'd be lugging around boxes of records and in no time at all, they'd be all sold out. And he's like, he started that way back when he was yeah. first starting, he would have a, the old truck or an old car with 45s the in boot. the back. Yeah. And uh, realize, hey, if I sing a song about this town, yeah. they're going to buy the record about it. Yeah. And he, that's what he started doing. And that's actually how it all came to be because he didn't even say he's not the greatest singer. And he's not the greatest guy at keeping tempo. Mm -hmm. But when you sing a song that connects. that connects to people, they love it. Yeah. And so he found that's what he started to do. He said, every town I go to, I'm going to talk to the local people. Get I'm going to find out a story yeah. that I can put into a song. Mm -hmm. So he said, the next time I come to this town, I'm going to have that song. Mm -hmm. And that's like Sudbury is the greatest example. For sure. He, when he came back to Sudbury with Sudbury Saturday Night, the yeah. place went crazy and they booked him in that bar for 13 months or something. I can't even remember. And they even warned him that the company Inco wouldn't appreciate that song, but the locals didn't care. They oh, ate yeah. it up. They loved it. And I guess Inco learned to like it too. <laughs> it's one of his biggest hits. Every, yeah. every live show he had to play it. It's been real good talking to you about Stomp and Tom Bryan. One more question. As Tom was getting on in years, was he still able to do that signature stump? He did it less and less. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> like when we were in the studio for the final records, he would uh, only want to do the stomp on a couple of songs. Because mm. I don't know if you've ever tried to do it, but when you're stomping, you, you have to stand on one leg. Yes, it's hard. It's hard, and it's physically demanding. It is. Some days I can do it better than others. I can usually pull it off, but uh, it takes a lot of balance, a lot of concentration, and... Um, like, how old was he when he passed away? Uh, 77, I believe. Yeah. So I'm 20 years his junior as we speak, so uh, I can still stand on one leg and stomp, but uh, I don't know, about 20 years from now. We'll check in in 20 years and see if I'm still stomping. <laughs> but uh, it's been a real pleasure speaking with Brian Houston about stomping Tom Connors. Thanks.